Hi, I'm Mike Miller, and I hope you're having a great day. Thanks so much for checking out the show. Today, I have an amazing photographer who's been involved with, with making pictures since he was five years old. He and his dad did a lot of work with the Major Jack Daniels uh, advertising commercials and worked with Life Magazine, National Geographic, and Look, and I'm very honored to have Junebug Clark here today. Thank well, thank you, you Mike. Being here. You really have a great exhibit down there at the UNT on the square that's running throughout June. It's running actually to July 22nd is when we'll July tear it down. 22nd. So it's a whole month of, of June and the 22nd of July, and they're open from 9 until noon on weekdays, and then from 1 until 5. Thursday night they're open extended hours till 8, and Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 3. That's a great place for an exhibit, too. Oh, they really did a wonderful job, and I'll tell you, it's a... Uh, I'm really proud to have that exhibit there that really honors the, my dad and his wonderful legacy. The, um, some of the earliest pictures that your dad took were in, in the Tennessee area and then he took pictures in Detroit as well? It's quite an interesting story, Mike. He actually uh, grew up in Cumberland Gap, Tennessee. That's right where Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee all meet. Oh, really? And when he was going to school there, they only went like three months out of the year because it was a farming community. Hmm. And when he started fifth grade, the schoolhouse actually burned down. That was the end of his formal education. Really? So he actually became a carpenter for a while, but then he said he moved to Detroit when Henry Ford was paying us hillbillies $5 a day to build this town. Yeah. And although he moved to Detroit, because of that, he didn't get a job in the auto factories. He got a job at J.L. Hudson's, a 13-story department store in downtown Detroit. And what he was a night watchman there. And what ended up happening was he would, uh, when he was working at night, the advertising photographers would come in and they'd be doing all their advertising shoots and my dad would just stand there and watch them. And he said they always called him the hillbilly, doesn't even know if they knew his real name or not. And one day he was going home on vacation and one of the guys gave him a camera and three rolls of film and said, hillbilly, how about taking us some pictures of the mountains you've been telling such big lies about? So he went home and by a strange coincidence, the day that he came back, it was 1938, Life Magazine was in its infancy about to explode with the war years. And the day he came back, these guys brought an editor from Life Magazine to watch him shoot. I mean, he was trying to recruit these guys. They were really top photographers, and they wanted some stringers. And they right away introduced my dad as, this is our hillbilly snap shooter. He just came back from taking pictures in Cumberland Gap, Tennessee. Cumberland Gap, the art director said. He goes, wow, that's a beautiful place. I'd love to see those pictures. I mean, what did you shoot? And my dad's wife so went home and took pictures of kin folks and friends. And, and so what were you doing? They said, well, it was, I actually went home for a, uh, a funeral. He goes, wow, a mountain funeral. I'd love to see those pictures. And being the first pictures my dad took, when he opened the, the rolls of film, there's a little piece of paper inside, and it told you how to set the the, your camera for sunny days and cloudy days and he said, oh, yeah. and he said I, I don't even know if they're gonna come out because it was raining a mountain funeral in the rain this guy said you can kinda hear how this is going yeah but this guy actually wrote my dad four times asking for those pictures and like hmm. anybody that shot their first pictures just sitting on his dresser unprocessed next letter came in he took him to the drugstore <clears throat> excuse me had them processed and looked at them, and they're just kin folks and friends. And one day he went into work, and his boss called him in his office, handed him a phone, and it was that editor from Life magazine. Where are those pictures? My dad said he was so shook up because that was the first long distance phone call he ever had in his life. Really? And he just left work, packaged up everything, shipped it to New York, and out of those first three 12 exposure rolls, he had 14 pictures in Life magazine. That's great. Said it wasn't long after that he decided to quit work and take up photography. And he did various assignments for Life magazines over the years. Oh, you bet. I just actually, the uh, all of the Clark archives have been donated to the University of North Texas, and the Special Collections Unit is uh, there archiving everything and digitizing it and putting online for everybody to see. And the uh, 
Now, is that the Portal of Texas, where people would go to see some of those? Yes. The Portal of Texas, okay. Yeah, and it's like Hunt for the Clark family. It's, 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 I'm in the process of working summers, adding metadata to the images that they've scanned. Yeah. And so it's slowly being turned on. There's so many of them. But I'll tell you what, by the end of this summer, it's going to be, there's some amazing things, because my dad always was a freelance photographer, the same thing. I've never had a job in my life, really, it's, except for three years in the Marine Corps when I got a paycheck. But um, it's... And you started working for the Detroit newspaper at, at an early age and... Yeah, it's a funny story. I was, my folks gave me, I complained when I was three years old about not having a camera when both my mother and father were taking pictures. professional photographers. Yeah. And so my dad gave me one of his old Leicas, a little Leica 3G that's actually in the exhibition there at UNT on the square. Oh, really? Yeah. And I just uh, took pictures all the time and my dad, you know, we had a, um, my dad had a studio and a gal by the name of Helen McQuarrie who was our lab person, and being that my dad's first pictures were in Life magazine, they always made prints like this. They were 11 by 14, mm -hmm. double weight, and reproduction quality. So my dad started off, everything we do is usually the smallest, is about 11 by 14. And um, so he would bring home, Helen would process my film and pick out a couple of pictures, and I would look at them and I can remember like complaining that my dad's pictures you know were like this they looked like this and like this but my pictures were all kind of cockeyed so my dad stood me up in front of a mirror and he said now look here's here's how I hold the camera for horizontal or or vertical and and you're holding it like this you know I yeah. realized I wasn't paying attention or didn't realize mm -hmm. it so I kind of slowly kept learning level yeah and when I was five my dad was in our house with a bunch of models and art directors shooting a Stroh's beer ad. Oh, really? And as they were wrapping up, I ran in and started taking some pictures and everything broke apart and my dad dropped off all the film at our studio and Helen came in and worked through the night processing the film and making about, you know, 20 11 by 14s of the best of my dad's shots and she recognized the role that I shot and she made a 16 by 20 to put up an entrance to the uh, to the studio so my really? dad could get a kick out of seeing it. And, yeah. <clears throat> and that morning my dad walked in, saw the picture and got a big smile and walked back around to this work island we had and took all his prints and was laying them out to, to show to the art director when he came in and, and the art director walks in and immediately sees the picture and he goes, that's it, I love that low angle. So I ended up uh, as at five having my first advertising shoot a Stroh's beer ad. That's great. A couple weeks later, a word <clears throat> went through the Detroit Press Club after that ran that a five-year-old shot that, that, that Stroh's beer ad, and I got called in by the editor of the Detroit Times newspaper, and they wanted to do a feature on me, so I walked in with a stack of 11 by 14s about as big as this and started showing on my work, and instead of doing a feature story on me, they hired me as a staff photographer. Really? So I, there's a tremendous scrapbook that my mother put together. It's it's strange looking back, but for a nine month period I shot from at least one to as many as eight pages in their Sunday pictorial section. And really? After nine months, labor negotiations kind of came about. Yeah. And they sort of mentioned that they're breaking child labor laws by having a five year old on staff. And so I got fired. And it made the national news wire that the world's youngest press photographer got fired. So by the time I was seven or eight, I had got assignments for Life and Look and Saturday Evening Post and really tons of odd, odd, odd stories. It was. Uh, and you were doing so like on the weekend and in the evenings after school or in the summer. Well, all the time actually, because uh, some of the stories that ran were like a day in kindergarten. Oh yeah. My kids playing. Um, you know, in the backyard, a day with the Boy Scouts. So it was uh, uh, making cookies and different things. Just and activities was, you were involved with anyway, and you were capturing it on photo and uh, with pictures. Yeah. All with low angle shots. You what bet. does that mean? <laughs> well, it's just short. So oh, yeah. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was a difference. My dad was shooting everything from his perspective, and I had that low angle perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did enjoy seeing that exhibit today. Are these some of the same ones, or these are some different a ones? A couple of them are the same, but then there's a bunch that are 
just different. There's 58 pictures in that exhibit, and and it's really there's just hundreds of thousands. They claim two million pictures are there, but I mean oh, there's really? hundreds of thousands of of tremendous pictures. At, at, in the donation, there's about over 2,000 16 by 20s really? that were donated. And if they made it to 16 by 20, you know, it's a pretty darn good shot. Yeah. And and like this one right here, the, there's a reason that was put on oh, the cover of, of the, pr the program. Yeah, the baptizing in Old Town Creek. That, yeah. was, that was shot in 1938. And the uh, reverend here on the corner, Reverend Hugh Vansel, actually... Um, has quite a career and is he still he, alive? Uh, I believe he's gone now. My dad passed away in 1989. 89. And Reverend Vansel actually officiated at his funeral. Oh, so really? Yeah. It was. Uh, it's kind of the full circle. It wasn't unbroken. Yeah. It was kind of neat. That's some of the first pictures, and it's a very moving picture. It's it's really probably one of the most recognizable and talked about. It's in Dolly Parton's autobiography. Really? It was a poster for the Wolf Track Music Festival. Oh, yeah, I remember reading that. And yeah. uh, I've seen a lot of people. Uh, it's been in you know, a couple of interviews with my dad. And it's quite a, I have this one favorite 25-minute interview with my dad that I've preserved that I just love. And in there they do an early Ken Burns and spend time going over it and people have told me that there's actually 51 people in that picture and and people have studied it and you know told me a lot about it that what they've read into it it's pretty it's pretty interesting I get uh, emails and phone calls and everything uh, almost once a week uh, it's about amazing how that, things have changed so much in 50 years and with the technology like the lightning rod on on this house that was that was common back then you bet yeah you're right I haven't seen one in a long time and I don't know if you noticed one of the other pictures in in the exhibit the uh, the dog on the running board oh yeah yeah that's pretty classic too because you don't my, my dad used to always point out you know he, he was walking down the street and he always kept the camera with him and he looked and there was this car coming with this dog sitting on the running board and he says you know you just don't see too many dogs sitting on running boards nowadays so he just went and made a quick snap. That was actually a, a miscellany in Life magazine, which is the, the back page. You know, a lot really? of people, when they look at publications, they look at the cover and they Go start from the back. So yeah. that's, that's the, the magazine industry figures that's just as important as yeah. what's on the cover. Yeah, I've noticed that. Mm -hmm. And dogs love to ride in a vehicle. There's something <laughs> about that. They love the wind in their face and the, just like in the back of a pickup. But I, I can see how they would just naturally get on the side and just they have such good balance and they're smart enough they know to not jump and just ride and we're going somewhere yeah but uh, and this these in Detroit um, uh, yeah that's one of mine that I hope. worked on a series um, of Detroit's people and that's actually in the International Center of Photography the uh, baptized in Old Town Creek was displayed also in the in the Smithsonian really and it was part of a um, an exhibit called Rites of Passage. Yeah. And uh, this one I actually shot, it, every time I'd go on an assignment, and I had an assignment in downtown Detroit, and I always would leave at least a, a, allow an extra hour, hour and a half mm -hmm. before I even got the assignment so I could kind of take all the back roads and see what I saw. And, yeah. And <clears throat> I happened to see a young boy that uh, was sitting on the porch and stopped to take pictures of him. And as I was taking pictures of him, I heard some kids walk up behind me and I'm still shooting and, and these kids are talking about going to the sandlot and playing baseball. And, and so after I thought I had good shots of him because he's looking off camera and around, I went to turn the photograph of the kids and that's his younger brother and sister looking out the window. Really? And I snapped that shot and then was shooting the kids and all of us went to the sandlot to, to play baseball. I thought I was going to take pictures, but they didn't have enough kids for two teams, so I was the official pitcher. Oh, yeah. And when I left, this young lad said that, uh, Junebug, you know, you've taken all these pictures of us and you don't have any pictures of you. So I handed him my camera and he shot probably one of my favorite portraits of, of me with all the kids around me. It's in this stack. I'll show you that in a bit. Yeah, yeah. I think I saw that down downtown, too. 
It, but so many of these are black and white. You, you stayed with black and white just about. It's sort of the legend. Yeah. That uh, <clears throat> I mean, we did an awful lot of black and white. All the Jack Daniels whiskey ads were all black those. and white, and for 38 years we did uh, the majority of all their advertising and brochure photography and spent an awful lot of time down in the hollow. I usually, when people ask what I do for a, a living, how do you make a living out of photography, I, I tell them, well, you know, we did the Jack Daniels whiskey ads for 38 years. I've done a lot with Eli Lilly and Company, actually Elanco, which is their farm products. It's kind of Eli Lilly and Company slurred together, but it's oh really? It's you know pharmaceuticals for hogs and cattle. Oh yeah. And a yeah. lot of work for Budweiser, mainly with the Clydesdales and oh, really? and Warner Lambert, uh, another pharmaceutical company. So I usually have to admit I'm pretty heavy into booze and drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Cessna Airlines. Oh yeah, Cessna. Boy, I'll tell you what, doing a lot of the air to air is just exciting. Photography just gives you a, a excuse to go places and do things you normally wouldn't be able to or even allowed to do. It's just amazing. I, I often say that when it comes to making a great picture, I'm on the wrong side of the camera. I have to allow that what's happening in front of my lens and, and it's more about your relationships with your subject and the people around you and behind the scenes than it is about f-stops or shutter speeds or ISOs. It really is dealing with people and, and like I said, I'm, they're the ones that make the best pictures. Well, and the, the video I was watching this morning down at the UNT on the square, um, talking about putting heart into capturing the heart, having a heart, not just a, an artist with an eye, but with a heart for the, the feelings of the people, I guess, and just the, the combinations of, it seems like there are a lot of, um, 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 you don't shoot pictures of barrenness. There's always, there are always things, various things, in a picture. Yeah, we always call it real people doing real things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, early on, my goal, I ended up going to Rochester Institute uh, Photography School in Rochester, New York. Really? And, yeah. And at, in the middle of that, they moved to a new campus, and it was 68. All my friends that were in college were getting drafted, and and they moved to a new campus, wasn't ready, so I ended up enlisting in the Marine Corps because I thought that if, if I stayed out for a year, I was going to get drafted anyway, so I'll just go in and I'd just get out that much earlier and I thought, well, where would I get the best pictures? The Marine Corps. So that's where I went. And um, Do you have some of those here today? I don't because most of the stuff stayed with the Marine Corps. Those oh, were yeah, the first yeah. few pictures and yeah. in that interview you're talking about uh, I'm there with my partner Dan, yeah. who we met in the Marine Corps in 1968, and mm -hmm. we've been business partners ever since. And you were talking about like in the old days with the dark room and all that, but now it's still it's so similar. You have to sit at the computer and just um, do yeah, so and you much still want to be in a, a darkened condition darkened so you're color screen. correcting. Yeah, and it's. I'm here at, at the Mayborn School of Journalism now and working during the school year here and trying to identify uh, some of the students that are really interested in photography and trying to bring some practical knowledge because I've noticed that nowadays uh, people are not outputting things to hard copy or making prints or understanding that looking at it on your phone or a computer monitor doesn't necessarily translate to outputting to something. There's a lot yeah. of color correction and and um, profiling your systems and they don't get the really the opportunity to study, you know, yeah, the when good you're just, prints now. They're just looking they're at looking a, at a, something on a screen. That small, yeah. And if you had to go to any uh, electronic store you'll notice that there's usually a line of televisions and everyone looks different. You know, and so that's the problem. There's yeah. no standard, so you really need to work with some kind of standard so that, uh, they call it WYSIWYG, which is an acronym for what you see is what you get. And that's just something you need to learn. And it's hard to, I, you know, I was fortunate because I grew up in the business and, yeah. and my dad was 
was 44 when I was born, so he was oh, really? older than the average, yeah. you know, dad. Yeah. And but the way that worked out was that you know here I spent my life living with this great photographer. He was already and, established in his career. And when I was 21 <clears throat> and ready to change the world, he was literally 65. So I got to see what was important. Yeah. At age 21, mm -hmm. at age 65, what battles to fight, which ones aren't worth, you know. Fighting. Now, I had to learn yeah. by myself. Yeah. But uh, at least when I made a mistake or tried to go off in this new direction that wasn't working, I realized, oh, okay, that's why they do things this way. Yeah. And being a life photographer at that time was just, uh, I don't know what higher plateau there could be. And so I was fortunate to, I'd be sitting at a table, well, I mean, I'd be actually playing with little toy soldiers under our kitchen table and sitting around it like this would be my dad and maybe Gene Smith and uh, Arnold Newman or I mean incredible photographers that I got to listen to and then when I got older like David Douglas Duncan I got to carry cameras for these guys really and just uh, have such exposure to how they work and realize that having a Good reputation doesn't make it any easier for you. The expectations are just higher. So, higher, yeah. So you have to be on your game and there's and realize that there are no easy assignments. Mm -hmm. You have to take it. Um, everyone, every assignment very seriously. Yeah. And as an artist, and you're an artist too, so you know there's always this feeling of insecurity, and you have to learn how to feed off that insecurity. Yeah. Because if you're feeling secure probably not one of your better days when you're working off that feeling of oh how am I gonna pull this off that it, that's when your best comes that adrenaline it pumps in and that, my dad had a saying about lazy people he always said that lazy people work harder because they've learned it's the easiest way to get the job done and my partner Dan and I just anytime we start feeling lazy we quote that to each other and so we can you know, dig in and get the job done, take it serious. And you mentioned on that video uh, two of your favorite photographers, people who influenced you. you yeah, Yusuf Karsh. Oh, Karsh, okay. And Irving Penn. Penn. And what was so interesting about them, they were both kind of did a lot of, I'm going to say portrait photography, but not really. It was people photography. People. Yeah. And They've both photographed a lot of great people. Famous people. Karsh is really, uh, I mean, some of his that our generation be more familiar with it. He did a picture of Churchill that really looked like a bulldog. Penn did pictures of Churchill. I mean, all these people, and it was really interesting to to just compare. Compare, yeah. You know, and realize these are both great shots, and it's the same subject, and they probably had you know the fraction of the time, however that worked, yeah. and so it. Uh, doing those kind of things I said it, it helped me in later life because my dad and I spent a lot of time together my partner Dan and I spent a lot of time together and we're you know we're working with the same gear yeah we have the same kind of film we process everything the same but we'd go to a location we'd come back with two different interpretations of mm -hmm. it and neither one of them was wrong you know it was it was really exciting when Every once in a while, my pictures would get picked over my dad's, and it was, you know, kind of a little competition, and yeah. and that's actually uh, very motivating. Most helpful, yeah, yeah to have yeah. that little bit of competition, so you don't get a flabby eye yeah. and relax and stuff, and then realize that, whoa, there might be, a, you know, I didn't look at it from this end here, or what, you know, it, it keeps you on your toes. What kind of camera is this? Uh, I shoot with two cameras, and usually students ask, and that's kind of funny because I, I have a Nikon D800E and a Nikon D4, so I'm usually carrying the, the 800. I point out, I usually say I have two different cameras. This one's very expensive, and the other one costs twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> but they're really tools, and um, they're more like, a, like armor. They're really meant to beat up. I used to always photograph a you know now that they're two actually different camera bodies although they feel and act pretty much the same but this um, this one's a d4 and it's really the most expensive one but it it shoots faster has a 
it's more sensitive and it has some features. The D800 actually shoots files that are three times as large. Really? But uh, there's what I call built-in hassles on the, the more inexpensive cameras. I don't know why, when they know how to do things right, that they, you know, make things just a little bit, you know, the control might be there, but it's hidden way back in menus and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And nowadays, um, cameras just don't last very long. They're like, they're mini computers. So, you know, a computer's life is like five years. Yeah. And so is a camera. So back in film days, all the improvements were really made in film and you're not in the camera itself, there wasn't much change, and you could have a body for like 12 years and end up selling it for half or even a little bit more than a new body would cost. Hmm. Now, in five years, uh, a $6,000 camera might be worth 500 or, you know, something. Really? Yeah, they don't yeah, increase in value now. <laughs> no, no, they just uh, disappear. It's, uh, everybody wants the latest and greatest. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, they are leaps and bounds. I mean, that's, it's just amazing how, uh, you know, the speeds and where you can shoot in very low light and still get great pictures or be in very high contrast situations, like the, especially doing all these air to airs for Cessna Aircraft Company. I mean, it, you can have this perfectly white aircraft sitting on a black tarmac in bright sun and still have detail in white and still be have detail in that black tarmac. Oh, okay. That's, so I mean, that's it's the, just just yeah. amazing. It's call it latitude is what they what the technical term is for it, but it's it's just beautiful is what it amounts to. Yeah. I haven't meant to overlook some of the many things you brought here. There is there anything in particular you wanted to to talk about or show? Well, I brought some just to Talk about some and, and, and how this will work, but this I, I always love this one. This is a uh, my dad. A lot of pictures he shot. He never had any pictures of himself until he was in his mid 30s. So they're kind of autobiographical, and that's oh, what yeah. you're seeing. Is this Detroit? So there's that's Detroit, and you can see a a fellow walking down the streets of Detroit. It's winter. winter. He's carrying a suitcase, and he's not really dressed for it. Yeah. And he's heading down the road, and there's a sign, Southern Food. So yeah. a lot of those pictures that my dad took were because he was a homesick hillbilly. Yeah. And this is actually one of mine. My dad, uh, we call this one the gate to nowhere oh, and really? the gate to everywhere. Yeah. Gosh, I think we're about to run out of time, though. <clears throat> I appreciate all the stories you've shared with us. and. And uh, thank you so much for coming. And thank you all for watching. And, and check out the UNT on the Square exhibit. And check out June Bug Clark on the internet, the uh, portal of Texas. He's getting that built up and more searchable. Thanks a lot.